Välkommen till Greenpeace podcast Systemskiftet. Och dagens gäst är Julie Michelle Klinger. Och hon är assisterande professor i Delaware. Och hon är här för att prata med oss om sällsynta jordavsmetaller. Och här är Sverige specifikt intressant och det är därför hon är här idag. Men vi tar förstås ett systemperspektiv på det hela. Dagens avsnitt kommer dock vara på engelska. And with this Swedish introduction, I welcome you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And um, actually we're going to talk about something called rare earth metals and their position in our transition. But actually already from the start, the name is not that appropriate, is it? No, not at all. Rare earth elements are not actually that rare. Uh at least not the ones that we use most commonly and rely on for most things. Yeah, it's like 120 to 250 ppm in the crust normally. Precisely. So comparable to copper or lead in some cases. So why is it then called rare earth metals or this kind of beach sand minerals? It's like going to go exclusive or having surfing connotations. Why Why do they have these kind of fun names in contrast to boring lead, dirty, <laughs> poisonous, making us stupid and aggressive? Why do they have this kind of strange name? <laughs> well, I actually did a deep dive on that a number of years ago because I was also mystified. First, uh, they're called rare for the very simple reason that when the first rare earth element was identified and characterized here in Sweden in the late 1700s, no one had ever seen it before. So it was simply presumed to be rare. And uh, as far as calling them beach sand uh, minerals, uh, actually monazite sands, which are found on black sand beaches, are a key source for a number of rare earth elements and other uh, so-called critical critical minerals and critical materials besides. Actually, we're recording this in Stockholm and one of these lanthanides was discovered here, Eterbium, for example. That's correct. And we're not at all far from that island, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I plan to visit. <laughs> Wonderful. Have fun there. <laughs> Why have we now started to talk so much about these? They have some properties. So they are, like there are 17 different minerals. They are along the same row in the in the periodic table. And then um, what's the kind of characteristics that these minerals have that we want? Now? Ah, yes. Okay. So we are talking more and more about so-called rare earth elements because they have these fantastic magnetic and conductive properties, which means that they're in fact essential for much of the hardware and software of everyday life. And we're talking about them even more now because uh, certain rare earth elements are really important for uh, certain technological components to power our renewable energy transition. They're important for many other things besides, including um, you know fossil fuel energy generation and various uh, Uh, medical, scientific, and of course, military applications as well. Yeah, as catalysts and so on. So, yeah. Precisely, precisely. And uh, the the fact is that they have many of them have a little bit loose electrons in the in the outer rim of their uh, atoms, so they are they can give them properties that have these characteristics. Then, yes, that's true. That's true. And in fact, those very same characteristics do present challenges when it comes to separating one element from the other. And uh, that makes uh, separation and refining a uh, energy and chemical intensive process, uh, which is why I think over the course of the latter half of the 20th century, uh, production migrated out of the West uh, to the East, to China primarily. And now in recent years, uh, we're talking about reshoring or onshoring uh, production in the global North, uh, North America, Uh, Northern Europe. And so the debate about, you know, where and how to mine these things, uh, I think is really quite present. Yeah. And I mean, if we look at the history of these, these were actually mined, for example, in California uh, some time ago, and then the mines shut down, we had increased regulations on environmental protection. But also, since this pod is a system change podcast, we always look at the root causes of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, one theory is that You had this deregulation of capital in the 80s, so you had vast funds for investment, and China wanted to industrialize in heavy and strategic industries. Mm -hmm. And then you had all this surplus capital in the West, and you had the Chinese will to exploit resources, and this was a perfect match. So even here we see this kind of capital generation logic in the deregulation of financial markets having an impact on real-world realities. Do you agree on that description? 
Uh, yes. And I would add a couple of things to that uh, specific to the rare earth sector. A lot of the heavy and dirty industry in the West uh, from the 1980s onward you know, migrated uh, toward China. Uh, there just happened to be this really interesting historical coincidence between Reagan and Thatcher's deregulation and Deng Xiaoping's selective opening of China's economy to foreign direct investment and all sorts of things that were deemed strategic for China's further industrialization. But a mining enterprise is very difficult to move. It's much more difficult um, than, say, a textile company or um, an automotive assembly plant. And so the other piece of the puzzle there is, in fact, from the 1950s, 1950, actually, just months after the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, China's leader at the time, Chairman Mao, collaborated with Stalin in order to build a military industrial heartland around China's iron and rare earth deposits in northern China and inner Mongolia from the 1950s onward. And so this created the industrial and scientific foundation that once you had this regulatory shift with the deregulation of capital and all of this uh, some 30 years later, actually created quite a welcoming context for Western capital. And that's interesting. You make this link to the military industrial complex because... Actually, many of these uh, so-called rare earth minerals have actually been used in military applications longer than we have seen in the now often discussed green transition, for example. Precisely. And I think this is a pretty important point to emphasize. You know, a lot of folks first encountering, you know, the the issues surrounding rare earth elements and the green energy transition will probably run into a headline that reads more or less like green energy's dirty secret or something (laughs) like this. And, you know, what the headline means to convey is that, you know, the way that we source the materials that are essential to build renewable energy technology, particularly batteries and magnets for wind turbines and things like this, are sourced in a way that's not socially and environmentally friendly. And while that's true, I'm concerned that that does provide cover for the other, and I would say larger, demands for rare earth elements, which actually have to do with petroleum refining and the production of various uh, alloys and lasers that are important for military applications. For example, cerium is used as a catalyst in the, in the refineries. Precisely. And in fact, if you look at, you know, the rare earth imports into the United States by sector, petroleum refining is one of the largest ones. And so uh, the thing that I want to emphasize here is that, yes, you know, it is rare earth elements are really important for the renewable energy transition. But this emphasis on their application in renewable energy, I think, provides cover for their continued and expanded use in petrochemical industry and also in the military industrial complex. And that's important to keep in mind because, you know, even if a hundred new mines are opened in order to build all of the wind turbines and, and hybrid electric batteries that we need, we actually have no guarantee that the rare earths that are extracted from these new mines will in fact go to renewable energy applications. And I think that's a really key point here. Yeah, I mean, and quite often, actually, the military can pay most for most things because their things are so expensive. But then that is actually a good uh, take here because this System Change podcast often brings up, you know, the underlying root causes for environmental problems. And Mm -hmm. quite often this is kind of growth narrative. We need always more. Every problem is solved by doing more rather Mm -hmm. than less, Mm -hmm. like Politicians talk about solving the current energy crisis and many always mention building more Mm -hmm. and preferably then renewables, of course. What is quite often not so much talked about is why do we need all these things we buy? Mm -hmm. Why do we do all these transports? Why don't we actually, you know, decentralize services so people don't have to travel so far to go to the hospital or whatever they need to do? And why don't we spend more money on saving energy rather than, you know, building just new all the time? Because any new energy, as we are talking about here, has environmental implications. But that's like quite often forgotten in the debate. Mm-hmm. Precisely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of concern with making sure that we can continue to generate enough energy to fuel perpetual economic growth. I think that's the primary concern. And I think that also helps explain why uh, you know, EVs, electric vehicles, occupy, occupy such a central space in the you know, sort of resources for the renewable energy transition debate. But I think if we're really concerned 
with resource security. If we're really concerned with energy security, then we will uh, turn our emphasis, our, our attention much more seriously to efficiency mm. and to reducing waste. So for example, building, manufacturing millions of new electronic vehicles, in fact, may exacerbate our, our resource and energy security problems if we're talking about you know, single, you know, single small vehicles and not talking about also building reliable public transport, particularly in places where people need it more, right? So we need to be talking about shifting demand from... And know, also shifting demand in transport. For example, the, the Swedish transport plans for 2040, if we would have the same growth in transport that they are planning for, in 350 years' time, every single Swede would drive their car 24-7. <laughs> right, and so that's clearly not sustainable. Exactly, but it's kind of... It was this physics professor Bart that he already said, I think it was in the 19th century, like humans' inability to understand uh, exponential equations is going to be our doom, more or less. <laughs> that was unfortunately prescient, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and I mean, for example, where where I live now, you know, there is no public transportation option to go from the town that I live in to the place where I work. And so, you know, these kinds of structural problems, which force people into certain purchasing patterns, I think also need to be taken on to, you know, reduce our overall consumption of rare earths and other important resources. So actually what we're doing here is questioning the narrative that we always need to extract more, exploit more to have a green transition. Quite often to avoid a trip or do it together with somebody else is actually a smarter solution because then you don't need the same amount of resources. It can be, it can be. But I, I do also want to be careful that we are steering away from sort of individual, like every little bit helpism uh, here. And make, and I want to make sure that we focus really on the structural issues that force people to have to choose between purchasing their own vehicle or potentially giving up more of their time, try and economize within, a, within an overall uh, system or social context that's fundamentally inhospitable to ecological behavior. A theory we have been talking a lot about in this podcast is the economic system we have was developed to increase production. The limitation on our well-being and welfare was actually our capacity to transform nature into something that made our lives comfortable. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have solved that now. Our capacity to transform Earth is actually the problem now. We can produce for everybody's need, maybe not for everybody's greed, but at least for everybody's need. Mm -hmm. And the new limiting factor is actually nature's capacity to deal with us, the ecosystem survival, climate and oceans and clean water. That is actually the limiting factor. But the economic system is still you know, set for maximum growth and maximum extraction, maximum transformation. And we need to redesign that. And that comes back, as you say, that's not an individual decision to change the economic system. It's a right, political it's, goal. Um, precisely, because I think you know, one of the key challenges here are the politics of distribution. We certainly produce enough to meet everyone's need and, and more to provide you know, comfortable conditions for everyone. But that's not necessarily the social system of distribution that's certainly not coming from the states that we have in many parts of the world. And so to think about where rare earth elements fit in the midst of all of these challenges, I think means that our mining debate is inseparable from our climate debate, which is inseparable from our social policy debate. And that can, that can often seem overwhelming, but I would actually beg to differ and say that, you know, viewing all of these things together and each thing related to the other provides, I think, a really important clarity because it forces us to think through the implications of our various choices. So, for example, the question of, you know, where do we source the critical raw materials that we need in order to decarbonize our energy grid, even if we're assuming. And, of course, you know, the I think the most immediate or mainstream answer is, ah, oh, well, it's important to open more mines. And speaking from the perspective of, you know, of the global north of Europe, North America, you know, there's also an important global environmental justice dimension as well, which says, okay, well, the global north cannot continue to, you know, take the resources of the global south of formerly colonized 
places in order to build beautiful renewable energy infrastructure in the global north. In order to be more responsible, it's important to source things closer to home. So it might be overwhelming for our listeners now to hear about this kind of overwhelming amount of complexity, but, Mm. you know... Stay calm, because we are going to have more episodes. We are going to have episodes exactly on how to rearrange enterprise laws to fit the new narrative. We are going to talk about work time reduction. We are going to talk about how to have pre-distribution rather than redistribution, which is easier to get support for, and how to make this transition we need to do in a social safe way. So we will have more and more guests. We will delve into all these subjects. So we don't need to deal with all of them (laughs) here but it's important always to remember the context still precisely well we cannot talk about the subject of human greed without actually exploring the ocean floors and the space in quest for even more minerals Uh, what kind of developments ongoing here Oh, this is this is fascinating. Uh, the there are parallel developments uh, underway uh, in efforts to uh, mine uh, the deep seabed and also to extract uh, various resources from certain areas of outer space, such as the moon, asteroids, and other planets. Now, in order for this to happen, um, existing international law requires that uh, that there's a consensus among nation states and that there is a mechanism for um, parceling out uh, areas to be ex- explored and then that there's also uh, various standards for uh, resource use and distribution. And I think the thing that's most uh, mind-blowing about this, these parallel developments, whether it's deep sea mining or space mining, is actually how far along Uh, the organization of uh, various policy alliances and investment capital are, in fact. But then, uh, from a Greenpeace perspective, one of our global campaigns is actually stopping the deep sea mining because of all its consequences on ecosystems and our planet, and, and generally just not respecting the system limits of the planet. What kind of policy message would you feel would help us to stop exploration of deep sea mining? Mm, I think that uh, the same sorts of policy measures that would reduce uh, the pressure to open mines in uh, new ecosystems, uh, I think, also apply to deep sea mining. And that is simply in in our order of priority, we should first be looking to uh, resource piles that are currently mischaracterized as waste. So we should be first extracting uh, the critical materials that we need from e-waste and also from uh, waste from existing mine sites. And I think if we actually did this at scale, if we treated this like a priority, it would, uh, I think, remove a lot of the momentum or pressure to exploit ever further and ever more extreme environments for these uh, critical raw materials. And one of the measures we have been talking about is outright protection. It's only 1% uh, that is protected today. Yeah, absolutely. And and this actually raises the point. There are uh, plenty of areas that simply should not be sacrificed to the global mining juggernaut. And these are, one, areas that contain uh, precious resources, such as uh, water, biodiversity, uh, rural and indigenous livelihoods. And two, these are areas about which we know very little. So we don't actually know uh, what we might be destroying uh, if we authorize large-scale mining in these places. And by these places, I'm referring to, of course, you know, the deep seabed, uh, but also uh, certain contexts in outer space. We have a lot to learn about what is there. Um, And I think that need to learn and understand should be prioritized above the drive to pulverize these locations into industrial inputs. Yeah, and we have 500 years of knowledge of negative experiences from colonization, and we should start a new frontier there, in my opinion. Right. and But the debate around deep sea mining is very... Uh, It's very ethically charged on all sides, Uh, because I think in parallel to the debate around expanding mining for rare earths in Sweden, you know, the debate in favor of uh, expanding mining for the ocean is like, well, okay, if we don't mine in the ocean, then we are simply saying that we're okay with uh, violent extractive economies such as those that you see in the Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. And that kind of framing is uh, very compelling. But I think there's more to the story. Violence is also violence when it's hidden. Precisely. 
Precisely. And I think one of the challenges with uh, deep sea mining is that it makes the it makes oversight literally impossible. Uh, because, you know, it's operating in the deep sea environment. And so if and when uh, something goes wrong or something doesn't go according to plan or agreement, people will only know about it when they start to feel the impacts. And at that point, it's kind of too late, isn't it? And uh, another compelling argument you used was the lack of knowledge. We know so much less about ocean floors than we do about our species living on land. And whoever knows what kind of crucial web of life we destroy if we go down there and mess things up. Well, this is, I think, a point that um, if we think about this within the framework of urgency around uh, climate change and the energy transition, and this goes back to that fundamental question of does, you know, opening a mine in this place in the name of climate, does that actually undermine local and regional climate resilience? And the same argument, I think, applies to deep sea mining. I'll just give you one example. You know, there's an awful lot of gases, including methane, which is a really potent greenhouse gas that seep up through the ocean floor. Yeah, we have this methane hydrate reserves there that people also want to exploit. Yes, there are those. Um, uh, One of the things that actually mitigates the effect of uh, these methane seeps and getting into the atmosphere and all of this is the existence of these vast, largely unknown colonies of microorganisms. Their diet is methane. So these methane gobbling microorganisms would be, of course, disturbed and destroyed if we're vacuuming up various polymetallic nodules from the ocean floor. And uh, it may seem that, oh, you know, like if we put like the, the imperative for the global energy transition against the existence of a couple of largely unknown microorganisms, how can you even compare the two? But I think if we're making the argument in terms of climate change and fighting Uh, climate change, then we actually have to put those two things on the same analytic plane. That's a very important thing, because if you think you save one million tons of carbon dioxide and you emit one million tons of methane, that's a lot worse for the climate. So very good point. Absolutely. Thank you. And it does highlight, I think the debate that's happening with respect to deep sea mining uh, highlights new things about terrestrial mining. Because, for example, the same argument about soil microorganisms that are disturbed in order to open a new mine, that's almost never taken into consideration when, you know, a proposed mine is doing an environmental impact assessment. Like, what is the net carbon footprint or greenhouse gas footprint that results from losing or disrupting uh, those critical microorganismic uh, processes that are, are occurring within the soil. But then let's go back to your, your expertise on rare earth minerals. Sure. Because when we talk about these, some people are aware of you know, how the conditions for children in Congo. That's the kind of the standard example when you want to show that this is unsustainable. But you have also visited the Chinese mines. And China is the biggest supplier. That's what we talk about China mm-hmm. a lot here now. Tell me a little bit, how, how, what did you see there? Okay, yeah, so for, uh, in order to research my book, I lived and worked in China for a number of years and, uh, you know, developed a linguistic and cultural fluency necessary in order to conduct in-depth research, particularly in remote and frontier mining regions. And at the time that I was doing this research, which is now uh, a little over a decade ago, I encountered the, a whole range of mining practices from you know, small scale, informal and minimal environmental controls to large scale industrial and sort of in the culture or practice of uh, attempting to continuously improve and mitigate social and environmental harms. But I think that the thing, the really important thing to know here is that China provided 97% of the global supply of rare earth elements for a couple of decades. And just because China supplied most of the rare earth elements consumed globally, it doesn't mean that China has most of the rare earth elements. No, exactly. And, and already it's down to slightly under eight, isn't it? Precisely, yes. Um, in fact, since 2018, China has been a net importer. Yeah, because they do so much of the manufacturing. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes, and that's a deliberate strategy to kind of move the country further up 
in the value-added production chain, to move away from you know, exploiting their domestic resources and supplying primary commodities to the global market to doing more value-added processing. And so, for example, you know, many of the rare earths that are mined globally, with a few exceptions, most of them are sent to China for processing and manufacture into technological components. And this pokes a hole in the argument a little bit that, oh, we need to have these mines to be less dependent on China if anyway we send the minerals to China to process them into products. Exactly. The important piece of the puzzle that's actually missing there is industrial capacity. And, you know, speaking from the perspective of the United States, this is really a glaring challenge that the middle of the industrial supply chain has effect is effectively hollowed out. And so under that scenario, you know, without investment in manufacturing capacity and that sort of thing, you know, we could open a thousand new mines and it wouldn't fundamentally shift uh, the global division of labor, given the manufacturing capacity that's located in China. I think we need to be aware that's going to be another episode here. <laughs> okay. Uh, we had one in Swedish already on the subject of um, exploitation of labor that we are not always considering, like an exchange a business exchange with one dollar involved, it's like everybody perceives that as fair. But we have a very unfair exchange of products and labor in global north and south today. So like uh, an American household, an average, employs two people full time in underpaid job that they will then provide mm -hmm. globally. So uh, if we get four, five, six hours of Asian people's time for one hour of hours without being more productive then um, this unequal exchange shows that our development model is based on exploitation, not only resources, but on humans. And it's actually not possible for all citizens on the planet to follow our development model. And I think we have seen increasing minimum salaries in China 10, 15 percent most mm -hmm. years. And, and in the US and in Europe, it's around three quite often, which means that We're going to get, get, fortunately, less and less exploitation, but also then it's going to be more and more expensive to buy stuff mm -hmm. for us. So I think we need to start to understand that this kind of more and more cheap shit from <laughs> various, uh, you know, Costco, similar stuff all over the planet, it's going to end. Mm -hmm. We have system limits on minerals and raw materials and land and surface area, and we have also then the system limits of exploiting people are all around the globe. So this kind of abundance of stuff mm -hmm. that we are used to buy so cheaply, that's going to end independent on policies we have at home. Uh, I think it's really cheap commodities enable waste. Cheap commodities make it possible to throw away a thing after it reaches its stage of you know, real or perceived obsolescence. And I think that's actually a big part of our problem. So to return to the topic of you know, where do we get the materials that we need in order to power, I say, the renewable energy transition, for example, a really key undertapped resource has to do with looking with fresh eyes at what we currently perceive as waste. And I think this is really key because, yes, there are resource demands for building any kind of energy infrastructure, among them also renewable. But the solution is not necessarily just to start digging new holes in the ground. We can also reprocess waste from other existing or currently inactive mine sites in order to extract rare earths and other important materials. And also a really critical parallel problem here is, you know, the accumulation of electronic waste in all sorts of places, you know, in, you know, I, I'm sure listeners are, are familiar with images of the informal recycling villages in southeastern China. Uh, there's also similar sorts of places in, in Ghana where, you know, the world's e-waste is effectively dumped in these villages. And that's despite the fact that we actually have an anti-waste law. It's just that we pretend that they're going to be used, these computers that we send there. But that's interesting because you're actually going to visit Elko AB, which is one of Europe's biggest mining companies up north here. And they actually have enormous, I, I mean, really enormous amounts of tailings. Mm -hmm. And several of these rare earth metals are quite present in those tailings. And they now have decided to try to start extracting them from there. And um, that's like mining waste. And then the other side is then the recycling. And here we see the commission published a report some time ago 
And for several of the rare earth metals, the recycling rate is less than 1%, and for almost all, it's less than 4%. That's true. And it's kind of scandalous. Now, if we start talking about solutions, one solution would be that the political system and tax system and any other administrative measure would, in my opinion, then all, and that's part of our system change logic here, is it should always be more expensive to dig something up of the ground rather than recycle and reuse what we already have. Mm -hmm. Precisely. I mean, I, I would say that it's a, the fact that it appears to be easier to dig a new hole in the ground, that the path of least resistance appears to be opening new mines, I think is entirely an artifice of policy. Yes, it is energy intensive and capital intensive to begin to recycle electronics at scale. And as, as I'm about to learn in greater detail in the coming days, it is also energy intensive to reprocess waste from existing or past mine sites. But we also need to remember or really keep in view here just how incredibly energy intensive and capital intensive mining itself is. Especially these rare earth metals, since they are not like many traditional ores. Like you won't find a lump of them in nature, like you could <laughs> find, a, you know, a gold nugget. Mm -hmm. You actually, they are, yes, in the mines they are, have higher concentration, maybe like one promille or something like that. But uh, it's not like an ore which you can just take out and it's concentrated. That's not how these work. Precisely. Because we're talking about a family of 17 different elements, when you find a promising deposit, and a promising deposit might contain 2 or 3% of rare earth elements for the total material that you have there, you then have to separate you know, one element from the other. And each deposit is unique. The configuration or, and concentration of different rare earth elements is unique for each deposit. So each deposit poses unique chemistry challenges. And not only, quite often they are coexisting with uranium or thorium too. So Precisely. we have a radiological problem too often. Exactly. And, you know, going back to our earlier discussion, I think this helps explain why rare earth mining and processing migrated away from the West in the latter part of the 20th century, because in many cases, rare earth mining also created a radioactive waste management problem. So if you're digging up uranium or thorium as part of your mining operations, then of course, it is very expensive to manage that waste properly. And you have to manage that waste properly if you're conducting your mining in a context that has robust regulations. And so uh, also then to return to the question of mining critical materials in the eastern DRC or mining rare earths in an exploitive way in, in western China, I think publics in, in the global northwest are often confronted with this false choice. If we want to have our renewable energy, then that means that we're exploiting landscapes and lives in, in Africa and East Asia. And I think that that is actually, there's a lot of that argument that is actually made in bad faith, not because there aren't social and environmental issues with mining in different parts of the world, but because mining isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be socially and environmentally devastating. So for me, the cause for optimism amidst all of this is the fact that there are better and more responsible mining practices. The technology does exist, but within a competitive market framework, there are very few incentives for firms to actually implement best practices practices unless compelled to do otherwise. And in Sweden, every time we open a mine here, and we actually produce 91 to 93 percent of all the iron ore in, in, in Europe, for example, or in European Union at least, we always believe anything done here is always with a high environmental standard and better than everywhere else, only because it's here. But we see now there is a high pressure, not only from Sweden, but also from Europe, that we should open one of these rare earth mines next to our second biggest drinking waters, uh, you know, Precisely. Yeah. Uh, for hundreds of thousands of people drinking water. And yeah, I want to talk about this, actually. Yeah, we should, actually. But I want to mention, like, when people talk about best practice, not that is not good enough if it's too close to somewhere where you can't tolerate any leakage and so on. Precisely. Yeah. And so, you know, a really important piece of the renewable energy transition debate is precisely about sourcing the raw materials that are needed closer to home, so to speak. And so in contrast to these, you know, terrible images that we see um, mining conditions in other parts of the world, Sweden seems to be a very logical choice. But we have to remember that Sweden 
is not a monolith, that there is tremendous social and environmental diversity within Sweden as well. And so simply locating a mine in Sweden or in Norway or in Portugal, for that matter, is not in itself a solution. We have to look at where the mine is located. And particularly if we are justifying opening new mines in the name of fighting climate change, we have to then be very attentive to whether or not the location of the mine actually undermines local climate resilience. This is a question we need to be asking globally, of course, but I think the debate in Sweden really crystallizes this issue because the possibilities are open a rare earth mine in southern Sweden, which is further away from indigenous territories or indigenous peoples in the north. But where you locate the mine in southern Sweden is also really quite important because if it's located near a critical drinking water source, that could potentially undermine climate resilience and local livelihood security, particularly if or when there is a mining-related accident or disaster. It's important that you bring this also human rights uh, discussion into it because we have also seen that several of the Chinese mines are located in Tibet or other conflict areas regarding indigenous people's rights and so on. And we have the same, some of the new mines in Sweden are also in indigenous, crucial land for indigenous people. So we see also the human rights aspect must never be forgotten. It's like you can't sacrifice water or human rights or local rights to good livelihood for, you know, a dream about an energy intensive and resource intention intensive transition. Precisely. And I think actually this brings out a more fundamental issue when it comes to thinking about the geography of mining, like where we mine or where mines are placed. And often if a place is quote unquote sparsely populated or if it has a low population, it's often considered more desirable to locate a mine because, you know, maybe fewer people, the logic goes, fewer people will be impacted. But here again, the climate context really forces us to re-examine these assumptions because it's often rural indigenous livelihoods that are built and integrated with ecological systems in so-called remote places that are often the most climate resilient livelihoods. And so to locate a mine in a place like this where rural and indigenous livelihoods would be disrupted or destroyed undermines local climate resilience. And in fact, you know, from a crass policymaking perspective adds to the numbers of people who might be dependent then on more public support when the next climate disaster happens. It's really important to, I think, really be thinking about preserving indigenous and rural livelihoods in the context of the renewable energy transition. And so that can put us in kind of a difficult position. You think, well, you know, if you can't open a mine in the north of Sweden or in the Nevada desert in the United States, for that matter, or in Alaska, for that matter, then where can you open it, right? There's a lot well, of... They talk about Greenland now. <laughs> right. Well, there's a lot of, you know, throwing up one's hands in the air. There's a lot of hand waving about this. But I think that that kind of frustration, I think, stems from the perspective that the only way forward is to build a new mine, to open new mines. Exactly. And, and actually, I would... My counter argument there would be actually probably the biggest mines in Europe would be Paris, Hamburg, <laughs> Rome. I mean, just actually increasing those recycling levels could help us a, a long way. In this commission study I talked about, for some of the rare earth metals, actually 100% recycling or close, like 80 or something, would actually make us self-sufficient already now. And for some, mm. it's not the case. So for some of the rare earth metals already, you would be self-sufficient if we had recycling in place. Precisely. So I, what I would like to see is a sort of a hierarchy of resource exploitation methods. Method number one, let's look at waste first. Let's look at our current and longstanding waste sites, whether that's electronic waste, that's accumulating in dumps or landfills uh, or isn't adequately captured for recycling. And let's also look at tailings from current and past mining operations. And I would say only after we have really exhausted or come near to exhausting those resources should we talk about digging new holes in the ground. 
Now, there's a lot of resistance to that idea, you know, on the basis that, of course, recycling is energy intensive and expensive. But I would like to argue that also mining is energy intensive and expensive. But they're not paying their costs, so that's why it's still cheaper. <laughs> Precisely. It's subsidized. The public bears the cost in a number of often invisible in the near term ways. So like we always talk about fossil fuel subsidies. Mm -hmm. But actually, the mining sector is heavily subsidized by, for example, in Sweden, they, they are subsidized by 3 billion euros every year, not paying landfill waste taxes, for example. Mm -hmm. So you, you see this everywhere in, in the world that they don't pay their environmental costs and therefore it's profitable compared to reusing stuff that we already dug out. And quite often, many of these minerals are actually in higher concentrations in our mobile phones than they are in the mines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be the case. So when it comes to recycling or targeting our current wasteful practices as the next extractive frontier instead of digging new holes in the ground, the challenge is not technological. The challenge is actually social. And so similar to the way in which it took a lot of work to develop the social infrastructure at the local level to you know, implement paper recycling and glass bottle recycling and all of this, we need a similar kind of social infrastructure that channels discarded electronics out of households, out of the industrial sector, and even from decommissioned infrastructure that channels all of this into recycling facilities. And for me, that's cause for optimism because the challenge is actually not technical. Mm. It's a matter of social infrastructure. In some rare cases, it is a little bit more difficult, but it's just because it's not profitable. We haven't put enough resources in it also. Right. And the only reason it's not profitable is because we've designed things for mining to be easier and more profitable. And, you know, if we designed things that way, we can just as easily design things the other way. Yeah. And for example, one simple measure is to have a high refund on batteries and then you would normally bring it back when you don't use it anymore instead of having it in a drawer for 20 years and nobody uses it and then it's thrown away when you die. Exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I want to move up one step in this hierarchy of measures. And that is, we are now talking about recycling and then part of circularity, for example, is that you don't maybe need to own everything yourself. So like if we can share some stuff that we have and then the society promotes this, then we need less space in our storage units at home. And uh, we also can use resources more efficiently. And maybe we can buy higher quality stuff that lasts longer and so on. So that's like one step more, not buying everything we need to use. Many things we use very rarely, so it's no point owning them, actually. It's just a capital destruction and environmental destruction unnecessarily. And then, then there's one more level up, and that is then the, uh, the business models as such, where all clothing firms sell clothes rather than your right to be dressed where you like when you're bored with your stuff you go back with it and so on so and that's the case for many things we buy that the business model of buying stuff throwing it away after a short use time is outdated i would say and then you have the top level and that is still the economic system foundation so we started to talk about that and now we are talking about the recycling just to remind our listeners that this is not at the top of the measure chain we need to start always at the top with the financial structure, the business models and so on. But we are now on step three or four in this pyramid of measures. So just to remind our listeners that this is not our solution. This is part of a solution. Yes, exactly. And uh, I'd actually like to make a counterpoint, which is to say we need to start everywhere all at once. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> I mean, yeah. why be discreet? Why not just change everything? Yeah, why not? That's actually necessary. And... Then again, remembering the more you change and the quicker you change, the more important it is that this is done in a social, safe way, that people feel safe in the transition. Precisely. And, you know, when it comes to challenging the prevailing economic model, one which really runs on waste, our current economic model doesn't run on scarcity. It runs on waste, which is necessary for manufacturing scarcity. I think that it's actually stymieing or limiting innovation. I think there's a phenomenal innovation and design opportunity here to redesign many of the things that contain important metals and materials in order to be more modular, in order to be more easily repaired, in order to be more easily broken down so that the components can be recycled and reintroduced to build a kind of circular economy. And to me, that's a design opportunity. And the thing that's limiting that is not, you know, lack of talent or interest or desire for such a thing. I think the limiting factor 
culture is actually policy environment, which is very much predicated toward maintaining this overarching status quo that you mentioned and making sort of fixes in between here and there. The Indian author, social commentator, and activist Arundhati Roy said, the middle class environmentalist asks, how can I change everything without having to change anything? Yeah. And I think that really crystallizes <laughs> that summarizes our... the Swedish election campaign 2022. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even beyond that, you know, I think it really, our, our fundamental, you know, we're wringing our hands over how do we maintain everything we know and that is familiar without uh, producing, without continuing to be so destructive. And I think it's clear that that line of reasoning is, is kind of like a cul-de-sac. It's, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm surprised why have all parties stopped dreaming about a better future within the new system limits that nature put on us. They just want everybody to live the same life, maybe change the car to an EV and so on. But they actually have stopped selling a dream about a better life. Just like 2022 is the perfect life and nothing should change. We should just change some technology and everything is fine. That narrative is not very inspiring. Yeah, we've been stuck, I would argue, you know, really since the turn of the millennium, we've been stuck in a kind of futureless present. So I, I would say that, you know, for a long time now, we've been stuck in kind of a futureless present, you know, thinking back to the financial crisis in 2008, where the overwhelming priority was like, how do we, quote unquote, get back to normal? And, you know, this overwhelming priority with getting back to normal, whether it's in reference to the 2008 financial crisis or the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, getting, quote unquote, back to normal is turning our eyes away from this dream, this necessary dream of a brighter future. And I think that it can be really scary to dare to dream in moments of ongoing uncertainty in all of this. But I would argue that it's more necessary than ever particularly as we're confronting the physical limits of our economic and energy systems. Yeah, it's all our innovation and efficiency gains are normally targeting to continue growth rather than to give us more spare free time. One of our episodes will actually be about working time reduction and its impact on the uh, environment, how, how efficient measure it is. Uh, but that's for another episode. No, that would be marvelous. <laughs> that, I, well, I think that that, that, that issue bears directly on the rare earth debate. Yeah, it you does. Know, and it goes back to the point that you raised also about having more of a sharing economy, for example. So for a number of years, I lived in a place where I didn't own a vehicle. I was part of a car share program, and that worked really, really well for me. But I could see how that would be difficult if everyone is expected to go to work from eight to five. Yeah, but I think there the pandemic actually showed many people, I mean, of course, many jobs you have to be there physically, but... For some jobs, like mine, I don't really need to go to office every day. I go twice a week or so. Mm -hmm. And that gives me several hours more time with my children. Precisely. That kind of flexibility has direct resource impacts. Exactly. Because uh, if overall we need less of these kinds of, you know, private or privatized transport, then overall we can rely more on public and collective forms of uh, mobility and technology use. Even if my bike is from the 40s and probably have <laughs> paid its resource use many times over by now. But anyway, yeah, for most people, it's not that <laughs> energy and climate and resource efficient. One thing we mentioned a little bit is that how can we design products mm -hmm. to be easily recycled? And actually, I have a hidden secret here. I, I used to be a member of parliament, vice chair of the Environment Committee, uh, the Envi European Parliament. And... Um, one of the most efficient things we ever did there was the eco design directive to you know save energy and in many many times when i wanted to regulate so that you would easily recycle stuff or easily repair stuff you had a huge lobby wave from the appliance industry that no no this would limit design this would limit bullshit claims mm -hmm. what would you see here you talked about modularity and and uh, you know being able to recycle H have you seen any legislation anywhere that you would see that's a good step forward yeah there's um i think there's actually a really deep history around uh, mandating efficiency you know for things like appliances and things like this and there's always you know wailing and gnashing of teeth on the part of industry but then lo and behold you implement a standard and wow people rise to the occasion right precisely because it is an engineering and innovation opportunity i remember the lead light discussion the led uh, light yes, yes. yeah <laughs> 
oh, but there's going to be no romantic lightning, uh, lighting. It's all going to be, you know, we're have, having this boring fluorescent lamp. And I said, no, no, no. In one or two years' time, the LED technology will just totally dominate everything. And now you see all this kind of copying the early carbon thread lamps, for example, really beautiful light. So, so actually, this demand for efficiency actually improved also you know, the possibility to have romantic lighting or whatever, lighting or whatever. But then, of course, you have the rebound effect then. Mm-hmm. If your lighting uses a lot less energy, you tend not to switch it off or you have, you, you, you see more lamps. In Sweden, for example, actually the, the level of energy spent on lighting has not changed at all because we just had more and more lamps. So mm-hmm. we always also must remember when we talk about technological change, you quite often have this rebound effect where you use more. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. That's a really important behavior level change, um, which, you know, if you're um, and I'm sure many of the listeners are are familiar with various uh, emissions reductions, uh, graphs or charts. There's a wedge that has to do with behavior strictly. Um, and, you know, so there you know, I actually want to revise an earlier comment that I made there. Actually, individual action does matter. You know, if you make the changes that you are able to make, but then. You know, monitor your behavior a little bit to make sure that you're not canceling out some of the gains. And but yeah. there's still there's a political dimension. You need to make that modification of behavior profitable and uh, help you improve your life quality, uh, and not put only the responsibility on individual solving everything. So still there is Absolutely. this. I mean, you modified your comment, but you still were right in one sentence that. This doesn't happen by itself. You can actually promote behavior change too by political decision making. Exactly, and it is much easier to be green if you are not starved for time. If you have reliable, safe housing, it's much easier to be green if you are not precarious, if you're not wondering where the next paycheck is going to come from. And so I know we've strayed a little bit from the topic of rare earth elements, but really it is Uh, it is impossible to separate any of these issues from the fundamental question of resource use, which is also a fundamental of question of, of from where do we source the resources we need. And uh, rather than put us in a state of overwhelm and potential paralysis, I would say that this should be galvanizing because it means whatever your passion is, it contributes Right? It, it contributes to this systemic change uh, that we're talking about here today. And thank you for that comment. It's a wonderful teaser for coming episodes on work time <laughs> reduction, <laughs> reorganizing work life balance, social changes. So tune in and <laughs> listen to coming episodes to dwell into that in depth. <laughs> well, it was really nice having you here. And uh, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, good luck visiting the Swedish mining sector. Thank you very much. I nästa veckas avsnitt så träffar vi Johan Mannerich Rävnanen och Gustav Skarsgård. Vi ska prata om hur man kan dra paralleller mellan ett missbruk, drogmissbruk eller alkoholmissbruk och vårt fossilberoende. Kan vi lära oss någonting av behandlingarna mot det? Tack för att ni lyssnade på dagens program som gjordes av Greenpeace. Där producent är Christian Åslund, Johanna Larsson, Ludvig Tillman och jag, Carl